Given the recent fire that engulfed the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, I wanted to offer viewers some perspective on the story of this famous building. We'll begin by taking a look at the history of Paris up to the point of its construction, before zooming in specifically to deal with the cathedral itself. If you'd like to skip ahead, please refer to these video timestamps. Paris in Antiquity Notre Dame sits at the eastern end of the Ile de la Cité, in the heart of Paris. This area has deep historical roots. In antiquity, the region was inhabited by a Celtic tribe known as the Parisi. In about 250 BC, they established their chief city by the River Seine. According to the geographer Strabo, the city was actually formed from twin settlements, one on the River Island and another on the fortified hill on the Montagne Sainte Geneviève. Over time, the town became quite prosperous and was known to mint its own gold coins. When the Romans took over in the first century BC, the city, known as Lutetia Parisiorum, was reorganized with their customary grid planning and rapidly expanded. It featured an aqueduct, a forum, baths, temples, theaters, and an amphitheater. A governor's palace was even built on the western end of the Ile de la Cité. Thanks to these modern additions, Pliny the Elder added this otherwise small settlement to his list of the most notable towns of Gaul. In the late Roman Empire, ancient Paris would continue to see more change. For starters, Lutetia Parisiorum was now simply referred to as Parisius. In addition, the still very much Roman town was becoming increasingly Christianized, and by the 4th century would see its first bishop appointed and its first cathedral built. Other external forces also altered the city's landscape. Barbarian invasions, for instance, caused parts of the city to be abandoned. Stones from the ruins were then used to build new structures, such as a large wall around the Ile de la Cité, as well as a new basilica and baths. Today, the remains actually lie beneath the plaza in front of the Notre Dame. Despite these setbacks, the city was not entirely forgotten, and the Emperor Julian even made it his winter quarters for a time. Yet by the 4th century, the waning Roman imperial authority in the west was taking its toll. The breakdown in the empire's economic network and military protections had a rather drastic impact on Parisius, which fell into a notable decline. However, the town, and specifically the Ile de la Cité, would never fully lose their importance thanks to their inherent natural defenses and strategic control of the river. Paris in the Middle Ages The Middle Ages would see much of Western Europe come under new management. This began during the 4th to 5th centuries when Germanic tribes increasingly made their way into Roman lands. One of them, the Franks, would settle in northern Gaul, defeat the last vestiges of Roman authority, and establish their rule. Though at first fractured, the Frankish tribes would be united under Clovis, who founded the Merovingian dynasty. His new Frankish kingdom would make Parisium its capital in 508. From the 6th to the 11th centuries, the Frankish realms would be in a constant state of fracture and consolidation, thanks to traditions of divided inheritance, which applied even to the sons of kings. Thus, the Merovingian dynasty of Clovis would give way to the Carolingian dynasty of Charles Martel, which in turn would be split into three after the death of Charlemagne in 814. These territories would find themselves further divided as power devolved down to the level of count and baron. This was especially true in the lands of West Francia. The impact of this instability on Paris was that its development slowed rather dramatically. Because the church remained as one of the few institutions with constant power, most of the new construction came in the form of religious edifices such as cathedrals, basilicas, and monasteries. The Ile de la Cité was always a source of some activity, but the right bank of the river remained quite unpopulated, and even the left bank was slow moving. Some wooden barricades were added as defense, but the city as a whole remained quite vulnerable. This would prove to be a problem in the 9th century, when Vikings repeatedly launched attacks up the Seine. The outlying lands were often ravaged, but the Ile de la Cité, with its large walls and fortresses, would serve as an impenetrable refuge for the population. At the end of the 10th century, the Capetian dynasty of Hugh Capet rose to rule the western Franks. Their reign would breathe new life into the city of Paris. Prosperity returned gradually. Old structures were restored, new buildings founded, and the right bank of the Seine was finally populated. Over the following centuries, Paris developed into an important commercial, cultural, and religious center, and the seat of the royal administration. The 12th century in particular saw the city experience an urban renaissance as large building projects were funded by kings, bishops, and powerful guilds. Among these would be the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Construction of Notre Dame As we previously stated, Notre Dame would be built on the eastern end of Ile de la Cité. It would actually be replacing the older Cathedral of Saint-Étienne, which was itself located atop yet more ancient Roman ruins. The idea for the project was that of Maurice de Sully, the Bishop of Paris. 
His plan was to create a new place of worship that would be larger and taller than any before it, and which would be able to employ the latest architectural styles and techniques. Planning took place in the 1160s, as the intellectual and material resources of the city were marshaled for the project. These would come to fruition in 1163, when the official start of construction began, with the first stone being laid in the presence of Pope Alexander III. However, work would continue in stages of improvement and expansion for two centuries. The building that took form would be a child of the Gothic architectural movement. This meant that it would be characterized by tall, cavernous spaces with large stained glass windows to bring in natural light. The gigantic structure was made possible by extensive use of rib vaults and flying buttresses, which allowed the weight of the roof to be counterbalanced by elements outside the building. The Gothic style is also noted for its prominent use of statues on the exterior. Upon its completion, Notre Dame would lead the charge on many architectural developments, and would be remembered as one of the foremost examples of the Gothic style. The basic floor plan of the cathedral followed the Gothic tradition, which was itself modeled after the Roman basilicas. As such, it formed the shape of a Latin cross. At Notre Dame, the interior of the shape is measured at around 130 by 48 meters, with the ceiling at just over 30 meters tall. The cross shape is broken down into several important elements. We'll summarize these briefly now. The base of the cross is the main entrance, which by tradition faces west. It has three arched entryways with an enormous rose window above it. These are flanked by two 68 meter tall towers. Just past this is the lower part of the cross, known as the nave, which houses the congregation. This area fits about 1,000 people and is flanked by sets of columns and aisles, backed by walls filled with many windows. The central bar of the cross is known as the transept. Either ends of it have smaller doorways with additional sets of rose windows above them. These are beautiful and at midday shed fantastic light into the structure. The intersection at the very center of the cross has four giant columns at its corners which help support the weight of a spire that reaches out above the roof. On the upper part of the cross is the choir, where the altar is located. This is where important ceremonies take place, and where only the clergy was allowed. Walkways on either flank called ambulatories allow for a procession behind the altar. At the final, top end of the cross is the semicircular area with large clerestory windows known as the apse. Here is a special chapel dedicated to Notre Dame, Our Lady, the Virgin Mary. An additional structure known as the Sacristie was added to the south of the transept to house treasures of the cathedral. Looking vertically now, the cathedral can be seen to divide into levels. The interior elevation was originally of four bands, with an arcade of columnar piers, a tribune originally covered with traverse barrel vaults and lit by round windows, decorative oculi opening into the tribune roof spaces, and small clerestory windows. Directly above these were the wood timber frames that supported the tin roof. Until the recent fire, these were once the oldest surviving timber frames in Paris. They were so immense that it took about 52 acres of trees to make them in the 12th century. Each beam is reputed to have been made of an individual tree, thus earning the lattice structure the nickname, the forest. Decorating the rest of the cathedral's top are many other amazing elements such as gargoyles, reliefs, and church bells. Adding to this are the countless other elements inside and below that I've unfortunately had to gloss over. Simply put, it's difficult to capture the sheer magnitude of work that has gone into the Notre Dame. Notre Dame through the ages. I now wanted to talk about the history of Notre Dame up to the present. As we mentioned, it went through an initial stage of construction from the 12th to early 13th century during the reign of the late Capetian dynasty. Another phase of building took place at the end of the 13th century, just before the start of the Hundred Years' War. Expansion to the cathedral notably included the addition of many large flying buttresses and the enlargement of the transepts. The next major set of changes occurred in the 17th and 18th centuries during the reigns of King Louis XIV and Louis XV. They were largely interested in renovation projects meant to bring the cathedral up to the more classical style of the period. This included rebuilding the choir in marble, replacing many of the original stained glass windows, and restoring the south rose. Additionally, it was decided that the original spire was so damaged by centuries of wind that it had to be removed. There would be more removal coming soon at the end of the 18th century with the outbreak of the French Revolution. During this period, much of France was subject to quite violent changes. Religious institutions in particular felt the brunt of de-Christianization efforts. Notre Dame was a rather large target in Paris. 
The cathedral was rededicated to the Cult of Reason and later the Cult of the Supreme Being before being eventually used as a warehouse to store food and other non-religious items. On top of being robbed of its religious associations, it was robbed of its treasures, many of which were plundered or destroyed. Mobs even saw fit to attack the structure itself, defacing many facades and lopping off the heads of 28 statues they believed to be of French kings. Suffice to say, this was quite a low point for Notre Dame. Fortunately, the cathedral would be saved by Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1801, the French emperor signed an agreement to restore the Notre Dame to the church and used it as the setting for his royal coronation. The structure thus had its status restored, but its features were still in tatters. Such was the state of its half-ruined disrepair that Victor Hugo in part penned his novel The Hunchback of Notre Dame to draw attention to its plight. Here's an excerpt from the book. Quote, Without a doubt, the Church of Notre Dame de Paris is even today a majestic and sublime building. However, even if its beauty has been conserved as it ages, it's difficult not to sigh, to not be indignant before the degradations, the innumerable mutilations that time and men have simultaneously subjected the venerable monument to. The novel helped rouse public support, and in 1844, King Louis Philippe ordered the church to be restored. These restorations lasted 25 years and involved a great team of architects, artists, and craftsmen who painstakingly studied all available historical records for guidance. Their efforts were a stunning success. The work included restoring the damaged sculptures, fixing the central portal, reinstating new glass glazing, adding murals to the side chapel, and reconstructing the great organ. To top it all off, they even constructed a new, more ornate central spire and added the sacristy to house the church's treasures. In the modern era, Notre Dame survived both world wars and would be the scene of a special mass to celebrate the expulsion of the Nazis from Paris. In 1963, and again in 1991, the cathedral would receive major cleaning campaigns and restoration programs to remove centuries of grime and soot, restoring its original coloring. In the past decade, new renovation projects have been undertaken to further combat ongoing pollution damage. Unfortunately, it appears that these may have inadvertently caused a fire to break out on the 15th of April, 2019. Just this week, I unfortunately had to watch as the 856-year-old Notre Dame was engulfed in flame. It appears that the spire, along with large portions of the tin roof and its wooden support frames, have been lost. But as this is an ongoing situation, I'll refrain from any specific assessments of the damage for the time being, as these are not fully known. However, what is known is that Our Lady once again calls out for aid. Please check the description for updates and look out for ways to support restoration efforts. Thanks for watching.